Hello, hello, hello. Internet, Facebook. Chad here from To Write Love on Our Arms. It is so good to be with you today. This is a very special Aloha at home. Uh, if you've been tracking with us on Instagram, if you've been tracking with us on social media, you know that we have a special guest today. His name is Jesse and he's with the Mocktail Project. And today we're gonna be having an alcohol-free mocktail social hour. So he's gonna teach us how to make an alcohol-free cocktail or mocktail, and uh, we're gonna have a blast. So it's not too late to get some of those uh, ingredients. Maybe you can go through your pantry or fridge and see what you can sub in and sub out. Uh, but you can uh, see those ingredients on our Instagram page. Uh, I believe on our story, we, we have a list of ingredients there. Um, but yeah, we're going to bring on uh, Jesse and then Elizabeth from our team in just a bit. But first, let's get to some quick announcements. Uh, today is uh, a special day for us. We are launching our third annual Black and White campaign in honor of Mental Health Awareness Month. So during this month, we are inviting folks into discussions through our blog, through podcasts, uh, and also we made a special merch line that is specific for this campaign, hopefully to create some conversation within your communities. Uh, so the phrases that we've selected for this year's campaign are, we need your presence, not your perfection, hope remains, and no one else can play your part. So we just launched that today. Uh, you can go to our blog page to learn a little bit more. You can follow any of our social media that should be in the most recent posts for that. Uh, coming up uh, next Tuesday, that's gonna be our next Aloha at Home live event. That's gonna be on Instagram. And that's also a really special day because Tuesday is Giving Tuesday now. So if you're familiar with Giving Tuesday, normally that happens in November, uh, but the powers that be said, look, this is a time where charity uh, could really use some extra help. So it's a new global day of generosity to support nonprofits throughout the pandemic. Uh, we'll be having that Tuloha at Home uh, Instagram live. Uh, again, that's Tuesday afternoon at four Eastern. And we're gonna be having some special guests there as well. So keep posted on our social media for more information there. Uh, besides the Black and White Campaign podcast, we have, uh, we've already launched our third season of the Tuloha podcast. We have two episodes up now, uh, one with our friend Aaron Moore, who's a licensed mental health professional, and a second that was just launched a couple days ago with our friend and board member, Chris Hewitt. So definitely check that out also. You can see those on our uh, Fear Won't Win self-care page. Um, Next down the list, we have our annual 5K event coming up. So yes, we weren't able to have a physical run, uh, but we have seen enormous traction on the virtual side of things. We already have over 2,600 people signed up worldwide. That's all 50 states are represented, that's 17 countries represented that are all gonna be running on May 16th for our annual Run For It 5K events. It's not too late to sign up. You can do that uh, through our store.tuloha.com page. Uh, you can see how you can get involved with the Run For It 5K event there. Um, also a huge piece of that is we're fundraising. That's one of our biggest fundraising pushes of the year. We've set a goal of $85,000 for us to continue our action in the mental health space to, uh, to present hope and find help for anyone struggling with mental health challenges. Uh, right now, we are at over $47,000, so we're over halfway there, uh, but every little bit counts. So anything that you're able to donate, we really appreciate that. Uh, next up, if you uh, saw me last time on Tulo at Home, uh, you saw a really sweet pair of headphones uh, that Skull Candy has been promoting. So we have a partnership with Skull Candy, and every month they are releasing a new exclusive products through their Mood Boosts line. And proceeds from that line go directly to us. So uh, definitely give them uh, a, a look online. Uh, they will be launching their second edition of Mood Boosts early in the month of May. So check out skullcandy.com for more. Um, for today, we are gonna be accepting questions uh, and that's gonna happen through the comments bar on Facebook. 
Uh, so if you have a question, definitely type it in there. Our social media team is gonna be perusing those options and relaying some questions to us that we're gonna be getting to throughout our mocktail hour. What else? Oh, um, if you really thought that a friend or family member should have been here at this live event, maybe they're still working or maybe they are napping or maybe they're out running errands or who knows, uh, but this will be saved online. Uh, you can check it out here on our Facebook page uh, or at Instagram TV or on our YouTube channel. We're gonna be uploading uh, this very stream. You can hear me bumbling all over the place uh, starting, oh, now the recording button just went live. So <laughs> we're gonna be uh, uploading this after we're all done to Instagram TV, to YouTube, and also our Facebook page. Uh, last but not least, Tuloha Blue Monthly Donors. We love you and we can't wait to see you a little bit later tonight. Uh, so thanks for joining us a little bit early and uh, we can't wait to hang out with you online a little bit later. That's all the business. And uh, now I would love to introduce you to my friend, Jesse Hawkins, who runs the Mocktail Project. So we are going to bring him on. Hopefully you got the memo of Tropical Thursdays. Uh, so as he's coming on, um, again, we will be taking questions today. Uh, that's going to be uh, through the comments on Facebook. Oh, we also uh, have just made live a donate button on the Facebook page. Um, so if your pockets are feeling a little bit heavy and you care to donate to, to write love in our arms, we have that option for you right now. Uh, so here is Jesse. Hey, man, how's it going? Hey, buddy. How are you? Doing well. Long time no see. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm missing festival season. It's... Um... Yeah, definitely missing seeing you guys in real life. Yeah, I was trying to uh, piece it together the other day. Where did we first meet? Was it Wanderlust? Uh, probably a good guess. Um, I know I've personally been going out to Electric Forest since 2016. And then, um, gosh, I, I've probably seen you all at 10 different festivals in my personal life. And you know, music for me has just always been that you know, that weekend of connecting and seeing friends and, you know, being present and being in the moment. And, um, you know, I love always seeing you guys there. It, it, uh, it, it, it's really, really nice as me as a non drinker, you know, finding that little tribe. Yeah, man. Well, it's, it's, uh, been a long time coming for us to have a, a collaborative event. And, Definitely. uh, if Tadia is watching you, this is also kind of your fault, Tadia. So thanks <laughs> Uh, <laughs> connecting us and, and making sure that such awesomeness can happen. For everyone that's not Tadia and doesn't already know Jesse, uh, Jesse, why don't you introduce um, the Mocktail Project? If you want to yeah, no, I appreciate it. It's, uh, so I personally made the choice to stop drinking uh, a little over six years ago, just two weeks ago, uh, April 16th. And um, yeah, as, as I always say, it, it's been good for me and better for everybody else in my life. Um, but, you know, it was something that, you know, as I kind of mentioned, you know, uh, music has always been something that, you know, for me, it's something that I love and I enjoy. And, you know, when I gave up drinking, um, I never thought I could walk back into those types of spaces, whether it was a bar, or a community event, you know, uh, a music festival. And so three years ago on my sobriety date, I walked away from corporate America and started uh, the Mocktail Project. And, you know, in a nutshell, the mission is very simple. It's about creating spaces uh, that's more inclusive and mindful and really trying to create a stigma-free drinking culture um, that's welcoming for everybody, you know, whether you do drink or don't drink or, you know, maybe just pausing in between a drink, um, you know, and so our mission is really working with, you know, music festivals and community events and, you know, we host different events and, you know, we make these really great non-alcoholic options. Um, you know, and it's really just about being very intentional and making sure that, you know, no matter who you are, if you want to attend the event, that there's something there for you. Yeah, man, that's, that's so cool. And it's such a, a needed kind of niche in, in the industry, in the hospitality industry. And I was just yeah. thinking you know, on this uh, January, I was able to go out on tour uh, with some friends in a band called Scary Kids, Scaring Kids. It was a venue tour and uh, obviously, a lot of these venues are sustained through alcohol sales, and sure. uh, 
great, you know, throughout that, that tour, meeting bartenders, meeting hospitality staff that have decided to embrace sobriety and uh, really talking honestly about just needing to still have outlets for being social. And just because yeah. you're saying no to a substance does not mean that you are saying no to, to people and, and embracing community. So, man, just hats off to you, your vision, how you're enacting it. And uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's kind of put it into action. What, uh, what are we making today? Yeah, so it's, uh, I'm definitely missing the summertime. I'm missing all of the flower colored shirts and all the, uh, you know, everything that comes fun with summer. So today we're going to make a fun little rift on a pina colada. It's going to be a pina uh, conata, so it's going to be non-alcoholic. Um, and then we're going to have a little bit of coconut in there and just some good flavors. Uh, so I'm going to hop behind my little makeshift bar here in the living room and Love we'll make some drinks, okay? Let's do it. Awesome. All right, so. First, like, mixing class. I, yeah, I, I know. It's uh, yeah. here. I'm going to move my screen down just a little bit so we can see. Ooh. That'll work. Maybe. Yeah. Good. All right. So uh, inside the pina canada, uh, we're going to have some fresh pineapple juice. So I have that here. We are going to have uh, some coconut cream of coconut. So I already have that in here. Uh, something inside of mocktails that I really enjoy is making different simple syrups. Uh, one of my favorites is a cinnamon simple syrup. So uh, if anyone uh, is unfamiliar with syrups, uh, it's typically just one part sugar, one part water. And then you uh, add uh, some cinnamon sticks in there, let it steep for about 15 to 20 minutes. Comes out, really nice flavor. And then we're going to top it off with some grenadine at the very end after we squeeze in some fresh limes. So first thing up, I know Chad breaking in his uh, mixer for the very first time. This one's been used a couple of times. So first off, we're going to add a little bit of ice. Doesn't have to be a whole lot. We're gonna pour this drink over ice anyways, uh, but we're just gonna add a little bit of ice. So we are gonna use two ounces of the pineapple juice. I'm gonna use equal parts of the coconut cream. So two ounces of that. This recipe calls for one ounce of the cinnamon simple syrup. I personally love cinnamon. I don't think that you can ever go wrong adding in a little bit extra. So for this one, let's go ahead and use one and a half ounces of the cinnamon simple syrup. All right, now for some fresh lime. you're going to give this a good little shake. Over the shoulders to the method, right? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh. First time? No way. <laughs> no way. I'm going to call your bluff there. I'm going to chop up a lime for the garnish on this. Oops, I don't know if I can get that. You can already see it has this really nice, like beautiful white foamy uh, kind of texture and color on this. That's from the coconut cream. And now we are going to just do a grenadine float. We'll garnish it with the lime. Now, how about the umbrella, dude? Are you going to teach us how to make the, the cool umbrella? You're the one in Florida. I'm in Kentucky. I couldn't find any umbrellas. <laughs> but this one has just like this really beautiful, like fun looking uh, color 
profile with the white layered with the grenadine. And for me, it's just like the perfect summertime fun little uh, fun drink. Absolutely. Let's give it a go. Cheers. Got to say I did well. Yeah, I think so. And that my, cup? Life is cup I did well. vigorously improving. She's like, this is so good. So, cheers. She's off camera. <laughs> Jesse, awesome. Thank you so much. And, and I reckon that there's more than just one mocktail in existence, right? Yeah, so as, you, as I mentioned before, you know, I started the mocktail project um, but over three years ago. And, you know, something that, you know, as a non-drinker, um, you know, it was challenging to walk into bars, you know, into festivals and things like that. You know, typically it's just like, it's two or three juices that gets put together or, you know, classic tonic water lime, you know, those always tend to be like the options. And so, um, you know, on our social media page at the Mocktail Project on Instagram or at the mocktailproject.com. I'm constantly trying to update, add new recipes, uh, constantly highlighting brands, you know, that believes in creating, you know, just a better drinking culture in general. And then really, you know, tagging and sharing, you know, people and tribes that I believe in that's really focused on creating, you know, just a healthier drinking culture in general. And so, um, you know, the Mocktail Project is just as much about, um, you know, really creating spaces where, you know, everyone can feel welcome, but it's uh, just as much about highlighting people and brands and, you know, working with tribes like you all, um, just to, you know, allow people to live a better life and feel comfortable and feel safe, no matter where you're at. Right on, man. Well, thank you so much for, for that lesson. That's definitely going to be a drink that I come back to. Actually, I need to literally come back to it because I left it on the other side of the table. Uh, <laughs> But, but yeah, man, this is great. So um, I love the conversation we've been having, but I can't help but feel like it'll be uh, only made more gooder by adding in another friend. So Elizabeth, if you're watching, uh, maybe put down uh, your Kanata for a second and come live with us. We'd love to chat with you a little bit. Um, but while Elizabeth is coming on, let's... Uh, uh, remind everyone that if you want to leave a question for us, you can definitely do that. Just type in a question into the comment field in the Facebook stream and our social media team will be sure to uh, screen that, get it over our way, and we will address those questions a little bit later. But here's our friend Elizabeth. Hi. Hey. Elizabeth, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Doing great. Is this your Taloha at Home debut? Yeah, first time. Man, about dang time. Welcome <laughs> to the family. Thank you. I, I feel the initiation happening already. <laughs> there we go. How, how did your, your drink turn out? Mine seems a little bit brown, but that might be because I did a lot of cinnamon, but it's not bad. It's delicious. Like I love cinnamon just as much as Jesse does. So it's good. <laughs> Very good. Mm. Yeah, delicious. <laughs> I'm trying not to drool a little bit. Um, <laughs> Yeah, awesome. So let's uh, yeah, let's have a little bit of a, a social hour. So, um, so Jesse, you, you introduced uh, the Montel project and a little bit of its origins uh, to us. Um, I guess uh, you you also mentioned that you engage with people at events all over the place. You mentioned music events. What are some other events that you've been able to kind of champion with this project over the years? Yeah. Uh, well, as you already mentioned, you know, I think that you know, I think we did meet at Wonderlust, um, you know, but uh, everything from, you know, music festivals to health and wellness. Um, I, I've always been a big component in the LGBT community. Um, you know, when you look at that community as a whole, you know, there, there tends to be a lot of uh, just recovery and mental health. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a space that I think people want to feel comfortable and need to feel comfortable. Um, and then, you know, everything from, you know, it's interesting, as you said, like music festivals in general, a lot of the uh, paid partnerships are big beverage brands. And so I've taken a different approach and really teamed up with a lot of big beverage brands uh, for things like food festivals and going there and actively promoting, you know, drinking responsible and making alternative options on behalf 
Um, you know, here in Kentucky, you know, it's Derby week, uh, which is postponed. Uh, but last year, uh, I was able to team up with Churchill Downs and bring the first mocktail ever to the Kentucky Derby, which was, you know, a huge bucket list item for me as a Kentuckian. Um, but you look at a space with like 200,000 people and to think it was 145 years before there was ever a non-alcoholic option, um, you know, it was a big deal. And so, uh, you know, whether it's community events or, you know, pride festivals, music festivals, you know, I think if there's going to be a cocktail there, then why not make it a mocktail as well? That's awesome. Man. Now, you you brought up uh, the phrase music festivals. So let's turn it over to Elizabeth. Elizabeth has served on our music and events team for for five years. Four? Coming four? up on four. Yeah. <laughs> man, so it's, it's really weird being home right now. Like generally, we would be out on the road and for some of our, honestly, like our, our favorite events happened earlier in the spring. Yeah. Um, so kind of leaning into that weirdness, uh, you know, it, yeah, I don't know. I guess maybe lean into the weirdness a little bit. How, how has this been for you to, uh, to kind of leave one sense of kind of road community and, and transition into what does kind of home community look like? Yeah, um, I, I just put it together that this is the most days that I've spent at home since I started festival season two years ago. And so it's been this weird realization um, that our world has been turned upside down. And I feel like I'm looking at the calendar every day being like, where would I be right now if you know this world wasn't turned upside down? Um, but yeah, it's harnessing the same, you know, same vibes of community on the road and transitioning them and making them feel normal for your day-to-day -day life now. Like, who can I reach out to? Um, how can I still be connected um, and not feel isolated during this time? Because it can obviously be very uh, easy to feel isolated. Uh, and also someone who is over two years sober, it's a whole different experience because um, as a sober person, you can already feel isolated and maybe that's when you uh, drank the most. And so it's transitioning and learning, you know, the skills to get through this this time uh, because it's something none of us have ever experienced before. Yeah. Well, let's let's kind of uh, ride piggyback on that a little bit. Um, you know, obviously, our sense of community is a little bit different. We get to see uh, we get to engage with every unique festivals kind of sense of community. We get to kind of uh, <clears throat> switch our, our our wardrobe and switch our language every single week to fit into different communities. Uh, so let's start with Elizabeth, but this can definitely be kicked over to Jesse also. What are some ways that your journey with sobriety has affected how you engage with music festivals? Who would like to go first? Was this me or Jesse? Yeah, first start with you, Elizabeth. Okay. <laughs> um, I think early on in my sobriety, it looked a lot different. Uh, I was doing traveling music festivals, so I was on the road um, every single day, different city every single day. Uh, for about two months. And um, there's obviously this uh, big drinking culture at music festivals, like Jesse mentioned, they're always sponsored by, you know, Bud Light or Coors or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and so early on when I was first kind of navigating my sobriety, it was very hard because you had the pressure um, that, you know, everyone was drinking. And then once I became more comfortable, and once I started going to more of these major music festivals, um, uh, I would spot their sober communities and instantly like feel at home and be like, okay, I, I have a place. Um, I know that I have somewhere to go if I start, you know, feeling those urges or just need someone to talk to who's relatable. Um, and I think now that I'm more comfortable talking about my sobriety, um, it makes it easier to connect with our audience and those who do come and engage at the booth. Um, because, you know, it's kind of like practice what you preach, you know? Um, and so it's definitely been an interesting transition, but um, looking back on it, uh, I feel like I've come a long way and there's, it's all about balance at the end of the day. Um, you really have to keep in check with yourself and check in with, you know, if I'm out with you at the booth, you know, um, it's really finding those grounding techniques, so. Yeah, you're right on. How about you, Jesse? How has your journey with sobriety directly affected how you engage with music festivals? 
Yeah, it's, uh, you know, for myself, uh, you know, I openly always, you know, share, it's my own personal journey, my own, you know, story into sobriety. But, you know, for myself, I started drinking at a fairly early age. And, um, you know, there's always just something that, you know, it didn't matter what the space was, whether it was music or just a family event, um, you know, that drink in my hand was always kind of that shield for myself and my own insecurities and doubts. And, um, you know, I drink to escape and to really, um, you know, it was, it was that object in my hand that if I felt uncomfortable, then I knew it didn't matter where I was, then I, I could disengage. And, you know, I, I can't remember how many good shows, you know, I went to and, you know, you would leave and you were like, what was the set? You know, like, you know, like you were there, but she just wasn't there. And uh, in 2016, I was two years sober. And my first festival ever was Electric Forest. Um, you know, I'd been to countless, you know, shows and countless just like bars and stuff. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it was the first time that, you know, it was just as so much about the people and the conversations and the music and the art. And, you know, it was really something for me and my own sobriety. It's been able, uh, I've been able to allow people into my life and I've wanted to allow people into my life rather than, you know, always having that closed door. You know, I think music for anybody, um, you know, it's something that truly we can all just be present and really lean in. And it's a euphoric that, you know, no alcohol has ever provided me, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and festivals in general, it's just, it's so many just beautiful humans being there and engaging and, you know, dancing and truly living for a weekend and just creating memories of, you know, so many of my best friends and, um, you know, across the country have all come from music festivals or, you know, those type of spaces. And, you know, none of that would have been possible if, you know, if I wasn't uh, present. Yeah. And that's yeah. been the biggest thing for me, you know, giving up drinking is just truly being there in the moment uh, and being cognizant of, you know, the conversations and the people that I want around me and in my life. And that's, uh, you know, that's what festivals and things like that have provided me in my own sobriety. That's awesome, man. And thanks so much for, for sharing both of you. And I think you, you both brought up this weird kind of dichotomy that there's this perception and there's this reality of music festivals. And in your mind's eye, it's like, man, it's like debauchery all the time. And what a lot of people don't realize is that some of the most successful festivals out there have realized that in order for their own survival, they need to have an inclusive space. So uh, talking to, or I'm talking about places like Bonnaroo, talking about places like Electric Forest, talking about uh, all the insomniac uh, events that are very intentional in how they lay out their sober programming. Uh, so, Bonnaroo has Soberu and Electric Forest has uh, Camp Serenity. And, you know, you have all these options of people that are waking up to the reality that, look, just because I'm not using or not drinking does not mean I waive my right to great music and great friends and great memories. So uh, for those of you out there that, um, that may be in your own uh, sober journey, you feel like you're ready to get back into uh, lifestyle events or music events, know that a space does exist for you. And if you have any questions, uh, message the Mocktail Project, message us, and we'd be happy to help connect you. And of course, wherever you see our flag, wherever you see the Mocktail Project, you know you're going to have a safe space there. Um, so we talked a little about how we individually uh, have kind of internalized the sober journey, but what are some ways that that's been externalized? What are some ways that at events and, and at festivals, your sobriety has elevated a conversation or really kind of um, uh, enabled a, a great moment of connection with the festival goer. Jesse, you want to hit it, Elizabeth? No, you yeah. go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, yeah, so I, I guess I'll go back to our very last time, I guess, seeing you, Chad, was EF last year. I think, um, you know, that was probably the last time I saw you in person. And it was the first time that I'd ever done a booth there. Uh, I had done some mocktail booths at some other festivals, but we'll uh, get back to Tadia. So 
uh, we first met at Lightning in a Bottle, and you know that's a beautiful festival that you know really kind of comes from more like a Burning Man culture, where you know it's very you know accepting and very inclusive. Uh, and Tati had pitched the idea of me doing like an artist hospitality, and you know I really didn't know because I think the perception is is you know artists are you know artists and they're just there and they use and they perform and you know, it's kind of that debauchery behind the scenes. And then, uh, you know, I did a pop-up uh, mocktail bar there for the artist, artist hospitality every single day. And it was truly just the most genuine conversations uh, from the artist and, you know, the employees and the people that were there uh, that was actually putting on the festival. You know, and they talk about similar to you, um, you know, just from a sustainability piece, um, you know, providing alternative options and making it safe and making it fun and enjoyable to have something in your hand that you even have the option um, that you don't have to reach for something that's alcoholic. And it's okay if you do. You know, I think that's the biggest thing about our mission is, is if you want to have a drink and you're comfortable, then that's definitely okay. Um, but it's always ensuring that you do have a tribe and a space and you have those options. Um, and it was something crazy. Like we were doing like 100 or 200 alternative options or mocktails at this little happy hour, um, you know, and everyone's like hanging out, they have a big pool back there at Electric Forest and, you know, all these like, you know, big time international artists are coming up and they're just like, thank you. Um, you know, because they're always on the road, they're always going and, you know, to be at your, you know, your peak and your, you know, being able to really perform and do what you love to do, um, you know, drinking every single weekend or every single day and, you know, continuing that throughout an entire weekend, it takes a toll and, you know, it's really not sustainable. Um, you know, if, if you want to really truly live your life to the fullest uh, and that was something that Tadia, you know, it was definitely her vision coming from the lightning in, uh, in the LIB space to really bringing it to electric forest. Um, you know, and this year we had plans to do some bigger, better things and um, you know, but we'll just continue to brainstorm and, you know, create for 2021 now on the EF side. Um, but, you know, it's it, it's been some really amazing conversations just with people that have approached the booth. I'm sure you all get it as well. That's like, you know, I didn't even tell my friends I wasn't drinking or, you know, I can't even tell you how much I appreciate this or, um, you know, how many times like a friend will come up and actually buy a drink or get a drink. And he's like, hey, my friend doesn't drink, you know, he'll love it or she'll love it. Um, you know, it's really cool just to have those conversations because it brings me right back to the 25 year old me that, you know, was scared to walk into a big festival or scared to walk into an environment like that, um, you know, and not have a drink because it is, it, it's just very, it's the social norm that when you go to a place like that, you're going to pregame and you're going to drink and you're going to go in and, um, you know, so it, it's for us, it's just about being ready, available and being in a safe space and, uh, just providing more options. Yeah, right on. Yeah. How about you, Elizabeth? Any stories kind of come to the forefront of ways that your sobriety journey has helped create a, an awesome interaction? Yeah, I'm trying to think of a specific one, but I do have a general feeling that I'll share. Um, first of all, I want to piggyback on Jesse and say, I remember standing in his um, booth at Electric Forest and a couple people came in thinking that the drinks were alcoholic. Um, but still being open to the mission. And that was such a cool thing to experience because I know a lot of people could just turn around and, you know, go to the next station. And so it was really neat to see people um, still open to the idea of drinking something non-alcoholic and being interested in what Jesse was doing. Um, so that was just cool to witness last summer. Uh, that being said, uh, more of a general feeling. Uh, obviously, when people approach the booth, sometimes you can tell that they have something more to say. Um, they're kind of holding their breath and they'll come up and say, oh, I'm, I'm one year sober or I'm six months sober. And as soon as I say, oh, like I'm two years sober, I'm right there with you one day at a time, you can see their shoulders relax and you can tell that they become instantly more comfortable because they know you can connect or I can connect with them on that deeper level. Um, and so that's really added a whole new level of you know, my personal story to try it love story, being able to say, oh, I know exactly how you feel. I've been there. Um, we're in this together. We can only do this one day at a time. Uh, and every time somebody trusts me with that little piece of um, information about themselves, it really um, 
hits close to home with me. So. Yeah. Well, I want to share really quick. Uh, I never pass up an opportunity to brag on my buddy Q. Uh, so <laughs> who helped start the, the Soberu um, side of things. And he worked with, uh, with our friend Pat to, to start uh, the consciousness group uh, at, um, at Insomniac events. And so you know, uh, Pat's a good friend of mine that lives in Louisville, right? Uh, cool. Pat's out in different Pat. Yeah. So different Pat. Maybe we know oh, you're talking Pat. about you're, cool. you're talking about Patachoa out in yeah, yeah. So Pat's a good friend of mine on the West Coast too. So we got uh you got Patrick Whalen here in Louisville, which started Soberu and yeah. the Sober Sailors. And then you got Patachoa out in Cali, which is now in what Portland, Oregon now. Um uh, so we yeah, so we met at um, at an Insomniac event. I was, so in 2017, as you know, I jumped in a van and went to all 48 lower states, just doing, seeing, living, uh, first time, like sober on the road, living. And Pat and I met at a um, at an AA meeting in, um, right outside of LA. And he was like, I was going to an Insomniac event. And he's like, well, you have to come down and see me. So like, I know his whole tribe out there. Yeah. Um, I love both Pats. Both Pats are great. <laughs> Pat and Pat, dude. So, yeah. uh, so Pat and Pat have a friend named Q and uh, Q is, is great. And uh, wherever we go to, or whenever we go to Bonnaroo, we do this event uh, or this activation rather called RSVP, where we invite people to write down on a postcard one thing that they wish they could say, and then later come back in the week and take a card that represents something they needed to hear that week. So every year, uh, Q comes by and writes a note that says, if I can do it, then so can you. And he leaves one of his NA tags on, on that card. And, uh, and I always know it's his. And, uh, and the intention is, if you take the card, take, take the keychain. And uh, I remember this past year, this young woman comes up, she touches the card, she reads it, and starts walking away. And, before she walks away, I said, hey, like, if that spoke to you, you can have it. Like, that's, that's a gift. You can take that home. And, and she said, you know, that's not for me. I'm, I'm kind of off the wagon. And I'm like, you know, you're, you're still welcome here. Like, I'm glad you're here. So she keeps walking away. And about 10 paces later, about face, she comes back, takes it down and says, day one. And like, I'm, I have like goosebumps bumps like retelling the story that I've already retold <laughs> a dozen times but like that's kind of the magic of these festivals is that you get to share something that uh perhaps has been difficult you know taking one one foot in front of the other but you never know when that's gonna impact and collide with someone else and give them the courage to uh to try one more time mm -hmm. um let's uh, kick it to a question coming from Facebook real quick um so one question uh, is, do we have any resources for those trying to maintain their sobriety during the pandemic? Uh, we do uh, at To Write Love on Our Arms. If you go to our self-care page, uh, so toaloha.com slash self-care uh, and scroll down to other resources, you're gonna see a whole list of, uh, of, well, other resources that we've compiled to help people with whatever it is you may be walking through, whether that's anxiety or maybe it's disordered eating or you name it but we definitely have AA and NA online groups and I think also some alternative sobriety um, online networks as well uh, definitely give those a look that just because you can't be in the same room mm -hmm. uh, there are ways that you can still interact with those people so it's aloha.com slash self-care Jesse are you familiar with with any other ones that uh, yeah, so there's a really good group um, that's specific more for the hospitality industry. Uh, if anyone works in that space and that even like, you know, goes over into like the, you know, obviously like the music space, um, but it's called Ben's Friends. Um, you can look it up online. I think it's like bensfriends.org maybe, but it's, it's based out of Charleston, but now they have them in like 10 or 15 cities. It's kind of a, they call it a bridgeway to sobriety or bridgeway to recovery. It's loosely based on AA and NA, but it's really just a safe space for those in the hospitality space, which we know is just like a difficult space in general, you know, crazy hours and stuff. So it's just like-minded people 
Uh, they typically have, you know, meetings in person, but obviously right now everything's on Zoom. Uh, so that's a really good one that's just like-minded people. Again, more just in AA, in a space, but, you know, it's kind of an alternative. That's awesome. Uh, so those links to uh, the self-care page for its Aloha and Ben's friends are going to be present in the comments. Uh, so if you're watching this a little bit later, just scroll through a little bit and you can see those there. Um, let's kick to one other question from Face Space. Um, let's kick this one to Elizabeth to start off. So what's a good way for people who are not drinking to share that information with people that might be drinking that night so it doesn't come off as judgmental? That's a good question. Um, I think honestly, this is just coming from my standpoint is being very direct and upfront about your choices and why you're choosing not to drink that night. Um, you might get questions. You might just say, I'm not drinking tonight. And then people will really bug you and really start to, you know, antagonize you and wonder, well, why, like, why not? And so I think honestly, just being honest with the people you're with um, is the, the best thing to do. And if you're with people who love and understand you, they'll be willing to accept that. And um, you know, respect those boundaries that you make for yourself that night. Uh, that's just my personal way. I'm like, I'm not drinking. This is why, you know, I'm not going to, not going to put up with, you know, your, your persuasion. If, if that's something that happens. Yeah. And, and Jesse, I'm going to add a PS to that question for you. Um, we have another question from, uh, from a licensed mental health professional who works a lot with young people, um, in their twenties and wondering how you know you could frame that conversation with a younger demographic and and also how have young people kind of responded to uh to the mocktail project is it just for old people that are tired of drinking or or is this uh, a valuable resource for youngins as well yeah no so i actually um I, I actually teamed up with the university of louisville um and we've done some really cool things you know typically around like spring break and working with different fraternities and sororities um you know and, and i'll say this I, I i was as guilty as anyone i know when i first gave up drinking i made up like the most ridiculous stories and you know all these things on like oh i'm training for a marathon and you know, like all these different things. And, you know, reality is most people really just don't care. As long as you have something in your hand, you know, typically they're more worried about like everything else going on. Typically it's my own conscious that I'm like, Ooh, like, I wonder what they're thinking. I wonder why they're thinking this. And, you know, I, I create this whole big thing in my head. Um, you know, and reality is a lot of times, if you just don't have a drink, a lot of times somebody's just like, oh, you, you why aren't you drinking or you want to drink? Um, you know, so I think, you know, one thing for young people that I always, you know, do recommend is, is if you're showing up to a party or if you're showing up to an event, do bring something, you know, that you know that you, you will always have an option. I think that's where, you know, what I looked at as the Mocktail Project was, is so many places I walked into especially here in Kentucky where, you know, drinking is so prevalent, you know, you walk into an event and there's all these, you know, beers and cocktails and drinks. And then like the only alternative option is like a water or a tonic water. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, you're looking at, you know, these craft beers or like whatever it is. And you're like, well, if that's my option or water, maybe I'll just have a drink tonight mm -hmm. and I'll just hop back on the bandwagon tomorrow, you know, but you know, I think taking that first initiative step to, you know, even come into the party with, you know, a couple of different options for yourself. Like, yeah, I'm not having a drink tonight. I brought something for myself. And you just kind of leave it there and it's a barrier. Um, but I think that's always, for me, it's being proactive when you walk into a lot of these social environments. Or if you are in a place that has a bartender, you know, nine times out of 10, or, you know, I wish it was 10 times out of 10, but, you know, nine times out of 10, if you just walk up to the bar, you're like, hey, man, I'm not drinking tonight. Um, you know, if I come up to the bar, I just want to let you know. And, you know, almost always they're super receptive. And they're like, oh, yeah, I, I don't, you know, and they, they understand where you're coming from. You typically don't have to explain it. Um, and then if you do, Elizabeth, I'm with you. You know, I think it, it's best if you just have like one direct, um, you know, mine always was just like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not drinking tonight. Um, you know, and then I would usually come up with something corny or, you know, whatever in my head and kind of.
roll it off with it. But I think so many times, you know, we make up, you know, something way larger in our head and then it becomes scary to say it. Um, you know, reality is, is you know, if they are your friends, like you said, Elizabeth, then, you know, they'll be supportive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think just to tag on to that, um, this is your life. This is your recovery. You get to call the shots. Uh, yep. that your decision doesn't need the approval of, of other people or if they feel judged by it, I mean, that's, that's not your fault, um, that this is your choice and, uh, and you deserve to, to feel confident in, in that choice. Um, but no, that, that's awesome wisdom. Thank you guys both for sharing. Uh, when, when I was getting ready, when I was prepping for today's live event, uh, I, was reminded of a bit that John Mulaney has in, uh, and I think it's the New In Town uh, stand-up that he did about when he started his journey with sobriety, uh, his friends just didn't know how to interact with him. They were used to to drinking John. And uh, he's like, you know, that's not me. And it, I'll let you watch it. I'm not gonna steal his jokes. Uh, but I think that brings up an interesting point. Like so often people don't, know that you are still a person, uh, <laughs> that your entire identity is not wrapped up in, in your, your night behavior. So uh, I guess to kick it y'all's way, what's one thing that you wish people knew about sobriety just to kind of get the, the awkward interactions out of the way? Yeah, I can start if you want, <laughs> Jesse. Yeah. Um, I think I think a lot of people skirt around sobriety once they find out that you are sober. It's like they're tiptoeing around you and your feelings and they're not sure how to navigate it. Like you mentioned, this awkward kind of uh, interaction you can have uh, starting off. But I think to those people who feel uncomfortable or awkward or don't know how to bring it up or discuss it, I think just asking questions. Like I remember early on, I felt alone because people were kind of, you know, skirting around the fact that I wasn't drinking and I would have much rather them ask questions like, oh, like what, what is your story? Or like, how can, how can I help you? Or, you know, you know, things like that. I think it only makes the sober community feel more isolated when people aren't willing to ask questions and understand and sit with us. And um, yeah, I guess I'll end it there. It's, uh, yeah, no, I completely agree. It's, um, you know, so I, again, I was 25 and I literally, like when I stopped drinking, I never thought, you know, the biggest thing in my mind was, is I will never go to another bar, music festival, like life, like my life was literally over. Um, You know, it got so bad in my own head. uh, I actually didn't think that I would ever be able to get married because you would have a toast of champagne at the end of your wedding. Like that was an actual acknowledgement that I shared, you know, like six months into my sobriety. And, you know, for myself, you know, I've done 100 times more things than I ever thought were possible ever, you know, in these six short years from, like I said, I jumped in a van. I've been to 49 of 50 states now. Um, You know, even crazy things like you know, and this is more like personal to me, but things like, you know, extravagant as going out to like a Burning Man, um, you know, and I'll never remember in 2017, I'm walking around the playa and I see these, uh, this little group holding hands. And I was like, you know, nothing's weird out there on the playa, but everything's weird on the playa. <laughs> and, but I hear them having this conversation and they're saying this prayer and I'm like, are they really in the middle of an AA meeting in the middle of the playa at Burning Man on, it was like on a Tuesday. And, you know, I think the more that you lean into just who you are and the the choices you make, you know, you realize that 30% of Americans don't drink at all. So that means, you know, statistics show that if you're in an event, one out of three of those people may or may not drink. Like that's just the statistics. And so, you know, I think so much of it is, is that you think that you're going to be alone and it's going to be a lonely world out there. And the more that you're just comfortable saying like, yeah, just don't drink. Like it's my personal choice. You know, somebody in that room either knows somebody or somebody in that room is sober and they'll understand you. Um, Yeah, I think, you know, for myself, it's just understanding that you can really do anything that you want as a non-drinker. There's really no space that you can't enjoy Um, or be present. Right on. Yeah. 
Uh, just a reminder to those watching, uh, we are taking some questions. So if you have a question for Jesse or Elizabeth or myself or any combination therein, uh, just type that into the comment section and our social media managers will be sure to pass that on to us. Um, so uh, like I mentioned earlier, typically this is a time that we would all be in event world. Uh, Let's, let's just um, name the thing that we miss the most. Uh, I'll, I'll start. The thing that I miss the most about events not happening right now is, this is going to sound cheesy, uh, but it's, it's the stories that are still going. Uh, I've, I've mentioned it a million times that there's events that we go to every year because, well, for a number of reasons, but, but near the top <laughs> of the list is, I want to see the people that I've seen for the past five years. Uh, I, I get to get snapshots of people's life and, and it's beautiful and it's such an honor. And, you know, seeing people that I'm meeting them on their first day of being sober. And then 52 weeks later, it's, hey, I, I've made it a year, you know, and, and you get these, yeah, these snippets of life and, you know, I've probably only shared a, a combined two hours with some of these people over the course of six years, but these are, these are my friends. These are my family and yeah, I miss them. So if anyone uh, of you is watching, hold on, we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, but we also live in a miraculous age of Zoom and Facebook Live and Instagram Live and we can hang out here whenever we want. So don't, don't be a stranger. But how about y'all? What are, what are some things that, that you're missing in particular? I'll go. <laughs> um, yeah, I think to piggyback on you, I think, um, I mean, obviously when you go to events, you're connecting with so many people. And right now it feels like the opposite. And like you said, yeah, we have Zoom and we have Skype and Facebook Live, um, but nothing really beats getting to like hug someone who connects to our mission or, you know, watching people fill out response cards and me having to like turn away because I'm like sobbing. Um, but also just the camaraderie in general with uh, music festivals and, um, you know, like you said, the friends that you meet along the way, whether that's vendors or people who continue to show up to our booth uh, every single year. Uh, yeah, it's just this weird void that we're, we're all trying to fill. Um, so yeah, I just, miss people. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, so I've been doing quarantine 2020 by myself. So it's, um, you know, you, you mentioned at the beginning, you know, especially being sober, you know, it's challenging being isolated. Um, and without a doubt, the thing that I miss the most about festivals is like the curiosity and just like those creatives out there just being like curious and leaning in and you know you talk about like the forest and like you can go in there and just get lost for hours mm -hmm. and you know it, it's something that for me festivals it uh it, it keeps me it keeps me very grounded in my sobriety because I go there to get filled up and I go there to have these amazing conversations and meet new people and you know truly live and you know just you know refill all that energy back up so that when I get on the road and I'm going to the next event or I'm doing you know the day-to-day -day life um you know I don't feel so drained and you know right now um you know it can be challenging because you know I'm not being very creative and I'm just sitting at home and not being active and you know festivals for me have always been that you know time to regroup and um you know that reset button like you said Chad it's you know meeting you know, so many people over the last few years. And, you know, that's my one space that I get to see, you know, that little tribe. I have 10 or 15 friends at, you know, the forest and I have a few friends at LIB and et cetera. Right. And, you know, that's my one time of the year to go reconnect with them. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm missing those and I'm definitely ready to like dance and bust out all my new moves. I've been practicing on my TikTok. So <laughs> there you go, man. Well, Y'all, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, it's been an honor to, to share this, to learn a new skill. Um, Jesse, if people want to keep up with you and the Mocktail Project, where can we find you? Yeah, so the biggest platform for me is Instagram. It's just at the Mocktail Project. 
Um, and then online, just at the mocktailproject.com. I'm constantly trying to update recipes and where we're going to be and doing different things, but I would love to see some new friends and say hello. Um, and then also on the Facebook page, just at the mocktail project. That's awesome, man. And uh, you're doing other of these mocktail hours uh, with people that aren't to write love as well. So give the mocktail project a follow. Uh, feel free to drop into to those. Just say Chad sent you. And, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, again, be sure you tune in on Tuesday for our Giving Tuesday Tuloha, uh, Tuloha at Home event. Jesse, Elizabeth, thank you so much. And for all y'all watching, we can't wait to see you again in person, hopefully real soon. Cheers, friends. Bye, y'all. Cheers.